looks like we're having one participant who's having a hard time joining. So I would probably just go ahead and get started. She'll probably try it again. Ms. Maldon, I think we're ready to go. I think all the participants are here and we are live on YouTube. We don't hear you, Ms. Maldon. I think so. I think we're okay to go ahead. So the team that would like to uh, that is introducing the speaker, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, given the title of Alpha Geek by Wired Magazine, Dr. Grinspoon is an incredibly accomplished scientist and writer. He was born in 1959 in Boston, Massachusetts, and graduated from Brown University with a BA in Philosophy of Science and a BS in Planetary Science. He also has a doctorate in the planetary sciences from the University of Arizona. One of his past occupations includes teaching at the University of Colorado as an adjunct professor of astrophysical and planetary science. Fun fact, Dr. Grinspoon is also a musician, playing guitar and composing for bands. Currently, he is performing with the house band of the universe. Um. His research includes the topics of climate evolution on Earth-like planets and conditions for life elsewhere in the universe. Dr. Grinspoon actively applies his expertise and research as a scientist in many prestigious laboratories in the US. Not only does he serve as an advisor for NASA on the space, on space exploration strategy and as an interdisciplinary scientist for the European Space Agency's Venus Express aircraft, he is also the co-investigator as well and the team lead for education and public outreach for the radiation assessment detector on the Mars Science Laboratory. In addition, he is the principal scientist at the Southwest Research Institute. And furthermore, he is the senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, as well as the chair of astrobiology in the Library of Congress. Dr. Greenspoon is also a very, a very accomplished writer, having published four books about the universe, Chasing New Horizons, Earth in Human Hands, Lonely Planets, and Venus Revealed. Venus Revealed was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize, Lonely Planets won the 2004 Penn Literary Award for Nonfiction, and Earth in Human Hands was one of the best science books of 2016, according to NPR Science Friday. He has also written for multiple columns, journals, and newspapers, including Sky and Telescope's Cosmic Relief column, The New York Times, LA Times, Nature, and more. You can find a more complete list of his work at his website, funkyscience.net. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Grinspoon. All right. Um... Thank you so much uh, for that that uh, generous introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be speaking with all of you today. Um, and I thought what I would do would be um, talk a little bit about um, my own journey from from uh, high school to um, to the uh, career that I've had. I um, when when thinking of a a title for my talk, I was asked to give a title. Uh, and I thought, um, you know, given um, who I understand the audience is, and given what I've been up to lately, I just came up with the title My Journey from High School to Venus. Because it made me think a lot about, um, you know, what I was interested in. Um, when I was in high school and thinking about the future. Um, and then how that those interests led me from one thing to another. And then most recently, the most exciting thing that's happened in my career very recently is that a team that I'm on, which has been trying to um, propose a new spacecraft mission to Venus for many years, uh, proposing this mission to NASA, working on it for, uh, for years and years. Uh, we just recently got selected um, 
our mission got selected, which doesn't mean that I'm actually going to Venus, <laughs> which maybe is a good thing given what we know about what Venus is like, but it means that I'm on a team which is sending a spacecraft to Venus. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, so um, let me, uh, so, so yeah, I thought I'd talk a little bit about just my own career and my own story in addition to the work that, um, that I do and that I've done. And then um, I'll leave plenty of time for, uh, for questions and discussion too. But let me see if I can now share my screen because um, I did put together a few slides. Um, see if I can get this to work. Um, Looks like it did, but I'm not at the beginning. Let me back up. We see your presenter view, not just. Oh, OK. So uh, there's a thing I have to switch views. There's a way to do that, isn't there? Um, let's see. Um, how do I? There's a I know there's a button to switch from presenter view to. Um, if you slideshow. go slideshow. Slide ah. Oh. If I hit presenter view, does that? Uh, no, you want the other one. Well, maybe maybe it toggles though if I hit presenter view because I don't see another one. Let's see what does, let's see what this does. That didn't do anything. Oh wait, no, it did. Did that work? We still you see, see your presenter view. Ah, oh, okay. Um, go go oh. back and um, just below. Yeah, right there. Push slideshow, and yeah. then you can go oh. uh, uh, play from start. Aha. Uh -huh. That looks, do, mm -hmm. do you see the, the slide no, now? We see your Still, presenter view again. Huh. I wonder if, um, okay, let's see. Um, and if I hit this, that doesn't help. Or did it? No. That's, we see your presenter view still. Yeah. So how do I toggle that? Um, it might be, or, do you have a second monitor? Is that? I do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I should just turn that one off maybe. That's I think that might way. be best. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Uh, let me take that monitor out of the, then I don't get to see my presenter view either, but then that's okay. Cause then I get to be surprised. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is it, fine. Um, um, it, let's see. This should probably work. If I do this now. Yeah, that worked. Okay, great. This, this is good. So, um, I wanted to start by mentioning um, the Apollo 11 landing on the moon, astronauts landing on the moon uh, uh, in July, 1969, um, which, you know, it's almost cliche to start with that. And it's almost cliche to say that that changed my life, but it's absolutely true for me. And I think a lot of space scientists of my generation, I was in the fourth grade. Um, and um, I, uh, it's, it's honestly, it's one of my earliest vivid memories of life is uh, my parents letting me stay up really late that night and watching it on the grainy black and white TV and seeing um, the, the uh, Neil and Buzz land on the moon and Neil Armstrong uh, bouncing out onto the lunar surface. Uh, you know, it just, it blew my young mind. Um, and it just was so exciting and seemed so unreal. And from an early age, I got very involved in just being excited about space and reading science fiction and thinking about the future. And it all just kind of got mixed up in my young mind, the science fiction I was reading and the actual space exploration that was going on and uh, humans exploring new planets for the first time. And it just it felt like uh, this incredible adventure that was um, just beginning that I that I really wanted to be a part of. Um, and this um, this is kind of funny, but um, this is from uh, when I was 12 years old. I there was this magazine called Kids Magazine that you could send in stories and drawings to and stuff, and they would sometimes publish yours. And I had a story that was published in Kids Magazine when I was 12. And this is the little biography of me that was in the back. It says David, who's 12 says that aside from writing and drawing, he likes to play the guitar, build model rockets, 
work with puppets and read science fiction. Um, and what's funny about that is that I really I read that now that I'm 61. That's just description of me when I was 12. But that's basically all the same stuff that I'm still interested in, except for I don't work with puppets anymore, unfortunately. But I, I still play the guitar. I'm still into science fiction. I'm still into rockets. Only I don't build model rockets anymore. But I work with teams that send actual rockets to other planets. So, um, <laughs> so I think my interests were formed at a young age, and. Um, among the science fiction that I loved when I was little, there were these books by Isaac Asimov called the Lucky Star Stories. Uh, Lucky Star was this, um, you know, the sort of hero who went around the solar system and battling bad guys and making the solar system safe for, for freedom and justice and uh, all the good things. And, um, and so there was Lucky Star in the Rings of Saturn, Lucky Star in the Big Sun of Mercury, Lucky Star in the Oceans of Venus. Um, and what the other the thing that was really cool about these books, I got really into them in in uh, like the fifth and sixth grade, was that they were these science fiction adventures, but they were based on the science of the day, except Isaac Asimov had written them in. Um, written them originally in the 1950s when we didn't really know very much about the solar system. So there was a lot, there were fun books, but there was a lot that was wrong. Like it says the lucky star in the oceans of Venus. When he wrote it, we used to think Venus was covered with oceans. Now we know that Venus is completely dry and hot and there can't be any oceans. So Asimov, he really re he republished these books um, in uh, decades later in the 1970s, um, which is when I got them. But each one had a, um, an extra essay, like a chapter at the beginning saying, here's what's in the book, but don't believe it, kids. Here's what we actually know. And here's how the science has changed since then. So I got to read this fun story about Lucky Star. He's in the oceans of Venus and he's battling giant jellyfish and telepathic frogs and all this stuff. And then there's also this, this essay in the book saying, but actually now we know it's not like that. Here's what we know. So it was both, each book was both a fun science fiction story and a science lesson. And that was just really cool to me, not just these fun stories, but the fact that what we know was changing so rapidly because we were exploring the solar system. So that was something that struck me at a pretty young age. And then this is um, this is a picture of me in high school. I'm the one um, with the guitar uh, and the big hair uh, on, on the right. Um, and um, the two things that I was really most into when I was in high school were um, science and music. Um, and this was just a, a band that I that I played with um, when I was in high school. Um, and those are probably still my two favorite things in life. And I've managed in some way to uh, to keep going with the music, even as I've pursued my career in science. But uh, the thing I was most um, into in high school was um, was science and space. And um, in addition to just sort of um, being captivated by, by what, I, what I was learning, um, I had a, a group of uh, a couple of other uh, sort of nerdy friends and I would, um, we discovered that we were allowed, I, I grew up in, in the suburbs of Boston in a town called Wellesley. And we discovered that we were allowed to audit classes at, at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which we could take the, uh, the subway in. And we, uh, there were a couple of classes on space engineering that we, um, we went in and audited. And we just, uh, it was really fun. And we just thought we were so cool taking the subway into Boston and taking this class at MIT. But anyway, so that was just kind of what I was, what was on my mind um, when I was in, in high school, um, and that prepared me to go off to college, um, where I thought I was going to major in physics, actually, because um, I, I just um, really that was the thing I, I thought I that's what I thought I was going to do at college. But the, when I got to college, my first semester um, at Brown University, I took a class called Mars, the Moon, and the Earth a class in planetary geology by a professor named um, Jim Head, James Head III, who's a, 
um, he's just actually retiring now. Um, and I've known him all this time, a great, great guy does, has done a lot of really important planetary research and an amazing teacher who just, uh, I was just so captivated, um, and, um, learning about the, the missions that were going on, the early missions in the, uh, in the sixties and seventies, this is Mariner nine, which was our first orbiter of Mars in 1971. That, um, was the first time we could really see these, uh, you see on the left, these uh, what looked like dried up rivers on Mars, which told us that Mars had a past that was more Earth-like. It's very dry and cold there today, and giant volcanoes on Mars. And that was really our first glimpse at uh, what this alien world was like. Um, and then uh, I'm backing up a bit because I forgot to say this before. I See, I don't have my presenter view here <laughs> before I got to college. Um, but this was also when I was still in high school, um, the Viking mission landed on um on mars um this was actually my my senior year of high school uh was our first lander on mars and th these first images i remember the one on the upper left is um was the first picture from the surface of mars and i remember it came in line by line so you just the first little stripe and then the next little stripe because that's the way the camera worked was just a little slice of the picture came in and so you couldn't really tell what it was and then as it got bigger you could say oh wow there's a rock there's another rock there's the there's the foot of the lander and it sort of started materializing and then this bottom one was the first big landscape picture of the dunes and rocks and that was so captivating i mean we're used now you're used to seeing pictures from the new rovers on mars and they're amazing but uh imagine what it was like when nobody had ever seen pictures from the surface of another planet and these came down and there's a lot that looks very familiar there's sand dunes and rocks but arranged in a in a different way so that was pretty exciting and then right after that um the next year i went off to college and this is i mentioned this guy uh, jim head i'm just showing you his picture because he became a mentor of mine and one thing um i want to say as a bit of advice um if you're thinking of careers in science or really anything is is seek out mentors um you know, people that are interested in what you're interested in, and you like the work they're doing. And, um, and sometimes people will be very helpful and they'll, be, they'll like the fact that you're interested in it and they'll wanna, wanna work with you and help you learn. Um, and actually this guy, Jim Head, he taught that class. He was a lot younger then, I couldn't find a young picture of him. <laughs> he taught that class uh, that, that I mentioned my first year at college, Mars, the Moon and the Earth. And I was so interested in it, I, I actually ended up working with him and changing my major to planetary geology. And I got summer jobs working for him and working for other people um, doing as a research assistant. And that was so cool to discover that you could actually get a job in the summer working as an assistant doing some of these science projects that you thought were so interesting and getting you know sometimes even get paid for it as a summer job so that was that was a wonderful thing for me to to learn that I could you know sort of start talking to these professors and learning about what they do and then when summer when it came time for me to figure out what I was doing uh in the summers between between my years of college I managed to uh, a couple summers in a row, actually several summers in a row, get jobs as a research assistant um, working on some of these cool uh, planetary missions. In fact, um, oh, this is also a story actually. So th this is from the Viking Lander 2 um, mission on Mars, which was either was Viking Lander 1 and Viking Lander 2. And what was interesting was they both landed in the summer of 1976. Um, and what was interesting was that the two locations on Mars were very different. And this is a picture of Viking Lander 2. And I include this because um, it has a rock on it that I that I consider to be my rock. <laughs> I mean, nobody owns a rock on Mars. Not yet. <laughs> but, um, but this is at Viking Lander 2. And my second semester at Brown, I took another planetary geology class. And one of the assignments we had was to pick one rock in one of the Viking pictures and write a whole paper on the story of how that rock came to be. And the rock I chose, can you see my cursor moving around on this? I think you can, right? Um, the rock I chose is this one that I'm circling here, which is sort of a round boulder with pits in it, but then has a face that's sheared off a flat face. And I chose that rock 
you can see behind it, by the way, there's a trench that the, uh, this is not a natural feature of this trench. That's the, the lander dug that trench to scoop up some dirt to investigate it. But this rock, um, I remember I wrote a paper and in order to do that, you had to imagine what Mars was like in the distant past and through all these ages and do your best to construct what that, the history of that was. And this rock, um, we think these are volcanic rocks so my story went that long time ago, and now we're talking probably, you know, more than a billion years ago, that there was um, a volcanic flood here, a volcanic flow, and that these were fresh volcanic rocks. And then over time, um, the volcanism stopped, and there was a, a lot of other things happened. There was weather and erosion and those rocks got broken up by different factors. And then those pits, those pits in the rock came about by, by wind. There's a lot of wind on Mars and a lot of dust and things get sandblasted over time. And so anyways, I won't go into the whole story, but I just, in, in that, that exercise of just taking this one, you had to take one rock and tell the whole story of Mars based on that rock. And, I, and so now whenever I look at these pictures, of, of from the Viking site, I'm always looking. And I go, oh, there's my rock. <laughs> so I'm just kind of, kind of attached to it. But that actually led to one of my first research jobs. It was a summer job that I had um, working for that same professor, Jim Head, in his lab. And my job, and this might sound nuts to you. But the, these pictures, remember, these new pictures of Mars were new then. We hadn't had them very long, and people were trying to study them and understand what they all meant. And my job was to basically count every rock that we could see on these pictures of Mars. So my joke of, is like, oh, yeah, I had a job counting rocks. You know, it sounds really boring. But what we were actually doing was a digitizing, marking the location and size of every rock in these pictures. So I gave each one a number. Um, noted its dimensions and its location in the picture. And then you put that all into a computer. And then that um, there's a program that can tell you about the rock population, um, the, the number of rocks of different sizes and shapes. Then that actually tells you something interesting about the processes that formed that population because those sizes and shapes will be different if it's from erosion or from um, some other kind of process that made the rock population. So, um, what was neat about that job, even though, um, you know, it, it might sound tedious, but I spent so much time looking at these pictures and, and immersed in them that I started to really feel like I knew what it was like to be on Mars. Like that I was, and I imagined that myself sitting there working on this, sitting on Mars with sort of the breezes and the dust blowing around my, blowing around my feet. And uh, I just felt like I got really uh, very intimately associated with, with Mars and that work led to a publication that they made me co-author on. So it was actually my first published science, which I did as an undergraduate assistant. So that was kind of neat. And the one other thing I wanted to mention was that when I was working on this, the person I was sort of working directly under who was um, kind of managing and teaching me um, was a graduate student there also at Brown, uh, a guy named Jim Garvin. And I actually have a photograph of him here. Um, and um, it's interesting because that was that was I, I met him again very young when I was an undergraduate. And Jim Garvin went on also to become a very accomplished planetary scientist and then a leader um, at NASA um, and a leader of Mars exploration um, and planetary exploration in general. And now. Um, I just I mentioned, and I'm going to come back to this. I mentioned that the um, well, the most exciting thing that's happened to me recently in my career is that I've become um, that I'm an, on a team that's been selected to fly a new Venus mission. That NASA selected us to fly a Venus mission. I'll talk about that. But the leader of our Venus mission is Jim Garvin, this same guy that I worked with on my first research job uh, when I was just an undergraduate. And now he's the head of this team that I'm on that's going to fly a mission to Venus. So this is all by way of saying, you know, you never know when you meet people on your journey, what role they're going to play and when you're going to see them again. And, uh, you know, sometimes people that you uh, 
you meet and you know at some early stage end up being very important in your uh in your uh story later on and that is the case with me and and this guy jim garvin who uh you know i met my my first year at college and worked with a little bit long time ago and now i'm working with again on this uh this venus mission so that's kind of fun for me um let's see um why is it not advancing oh there we go another mentor i wanted to talk about and this is somebody you may have heard of uh, a guy named carl sagan seen in this picture here um and um he's uh you may have heard of him because he's a pretty famous scientist and writer and even sort of tv personality you, you know the show cosmos with neil degrasse tyson well the first version version of cosmos was done by by carl sagan uh, and he wrote best-selling books and he was just a very um, uh, great scientist and great communicator of science. And I, um, the summer after my um, fresh, uh, summer after my sophomore year at college, I um, got to go and work at Cornell University in his lab. Uh, I got a research job working for him in this lab here that's pictured. And there we were, um, he was doing experiments to try to understand the origin of life and how the origin of life might happen in other, on other planets even, and, and how it might've happened on earth. And so you would um, mix these chemicals in those flasks you see on the left, chemicals that were um, sim similar to atmospheres of other planets or similar to the atmosphere of the early earth, uh, things like um, ammonia and methane and so forth. And then you would zap those chemicals to various energy sources, simulated lightning or simulated ultraviolet light from the sun and see what happens. And sometimes you would make these more complex chemicals that um, told you something about maybe how, how the origin of life happened. So I, I learned how to do some uh, analytical chemistry uh, and organic chemistry in that lab, but also working uh, with this guy, Carl Sagan was very inspiring not just because uh, of the science I learned, but he was a he was very um, had this sort of contagious enthusiasm about science, and he was also uh, a great science communicator. And being exposed to people like that made me realize that I wanted to learn science, but I also wanted to learn to write and learn to communicate well. So one thing I did w when I was an, both an undergraduate and a grad student at college was I um, I took writing classes, even though I was studying science um, as my main thing, my major, I took a lot of other kinds of classes. I wanted to be broad. So I also learned philosophy and learned a lot of other things, but I, I specifically took classes in, in how to, how to write uh, and had some really good writing teachers because I knew that it was something I, I didn't want to just do science. I wanted to try to learn to be a good communicator about science. So I, 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 I studied that too. Um, all along, and I'm and, and and I'm glad I did because I think um, communication is something you can work on and learn learn to do better. Um, let's see. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about um, just for for a minute uh, is uh, something called the Voyager mission, which was also very important. Um, well, important in the history of planetary exploration, but also an important set of experiences for me. So Voyager, seen here on the upper left, is a spacecraft that launched in 1979. Um, and for me, that was when I was a, a sophomore in, in No, I'm sorry, it launched in 1977, um, which is the year I graduated high school. And it was the first mission that was going to visit all the giant planets of the outer solar system in, and explore them in great detail. So it did a flyby of Jupiter in 1979, and then a flyby of Saturn in 1980, and then a flyby of Uranus in 1986, and a flyby of Neptune in 1989. So it sort of followed this arc all the way through the outer solar system. And it launched at just the right time when the planets were going to be lined up. So it could hit Jupiter, not hit it, but <laughs> go close to it, and then use Jupiter's gravity to get that slingshot boost out to Saturn and then encounter Saturn close up, take pictures and everything on the way through, and then use that gravity slingshot boost from Saturn to get out to Uranus and then slingshot out to Neptune and so forth. So 
because they launched at the right time and the planets were lined up in just this right way that they only do every 200 years. So it was sort of lucky that we could launch at that time. They managed to visit all of these planets in uh, basically just in a, in a decade. And um, it was very exciting. And it was great timing for me because um, it was just when I was learning about planetary science and becoming a planetary scientist. So I also managed to get um, a summer job um, in the, uh, as an undergraduate assistant in the summer of 1979 um, at this place called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where, um, which is where they were controlling the Voyager spacecraft and getting the images down, the pictures and the other information down. And it was very exciting because the thing about these Voyager encounters, okay, so these missions are flybys. You don't go into orbit and hang around a planet and study it for a long time. You fly by. So you're approaching Jupiter, approaching Jupiter for a couple of years. And then it's just a matter of days. You're flying through the Jupiter system. You're taking pictures. You're taking measurements. You're flying by the moons. You're taking. And then you have to keep going. You, you don't have any way of slowing down. So then you're back out into interstellar space. So it all happens in just a few days. And then there's a couple more years of flying through interstellar space. And then you do it again, you get to Saturn and there's a few days of frenzied activity where you're traveling through the system and you're taking the pictures and you're doing all that and getting all the amazing information. And then after a few days, you're gone again, back out into space. And it's years and years before the next one of these Voyager encounters. So the Voyager encounters were scientifically amazing, but they were also just incredible experiences because um, all the people involved in the mission, all the scientists and engineers would gather at JPL at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And um, they would, they would, uh, you know, there'd be these, this frenzied time of activity of getting all the information and, 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 you know, seeing the pictures and having press conferences and figuring out what it all means. And then they would sort of scatter and everybody would go back and live their lives and do their thing for a few years. And then as Voyager approached the next planet, everybody would gather again, but it would be a few years later. So in addition to being scientifically amazing, they started to have these feelings of almost like family reunions where there it is a few years later and you see everybody and everybody's gotten a few years older and some people have had kids and so, you know, it, things have happened. Um, a few people were no longer with us by the time we got to Neptune who had been with us at Jupiter. So it really was like a repeated series of family gatherings and uh, just an amazing set of experiences. And, and for me, so I was an undergraduate uh, assistant for the Jupiter encounters. By the time we got to um, the, uh, the Uranus in 1986, I was a graduate student assistant for the Voyager imaging team. And then by the time uh, Neptune came around, I worked at it as a as a postdoc, which was my first job out of grad student as a postdoctoral research associate. So it sort of felt to me like Voyager was going traveling through the solar system and I was traveling through my life and hitting all these stages as we hit all the different planets. Um, a really amazing set of memories and an amazing set of science. And you know what I realized as I was preparing this talk that today, January, uh, sorry, January, today, July 9th is the anniversary of when Voyager, Voyager 2 got to Jupiter. And in particular, one of the amazing things that Voyager 2 did was take great close-up pictures of the moons of Jupiter. And actually, I have a couple pictures here. So on the left, that's... Um, Jupiter has these four giant moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And on the upper left, this is the moon Io, which is the most volcanically active place in the solar system. It has volcanoes that are always blasting off. But before Voyager, we didn't know that. And one of the amazing discoveries of Voyager was you can see in this image in the upper left, this is the edge of the planet and this stuff shooting off into space. This is a volcano going off. And it was an incredible discovery as Voyager was flying through the Jupiter system, it took these pictures of Io and a very one very sharp-eyed investigator said, wait a minute, there's something on the edge of the planet here. And, and then they looked at the pictures more carefully and stretched them. This picture is stretched, meaning the contrast is enhanced in various ways. And it turned out that they had caught in the act of volcano blasting off into space. 
which is a very dramatic discovery because we didn't even know the volcanoes on on Io until we made that discovery. So that was amazing. And one of the other most amazing places that Voyager 2 investigated was this moon Europa, um, one of the other um, large moons of Jupiter. And Europa is completely covered in ice. And you can see on its surface, there's all these very long, dark, linear features, which turns out these are cracks in the ice that have been sort of filled in by like dirtier water and then frozen over, which is why it has these grooves. But again, we didn't know that. And one of the amazing experiences of my life was um, on July 9th, 1979. So 42 years ago today, I was in the room when the scientists first saw the first close up pictures of Europa. And this is kind of cool. I want to show you a little video now because there's a scene in the TV show Cosmos where they, by Carl Sagan where they show the room where the scientists are first seeing these images of Europa. And you can see Carl Sagan and the other scientists in the room reacting to seeing these images for the first time. And I'm actually there in the background. You'll notice, I, you only see me for a second a couple of times, but there's this really skinny kid in the back wearing a black t-shirt with a big head of hair. Okay, this was, you know, these were the big hair days. And I had like massive hair at that time. I know, I don't have any more, what can I say? Time marches onward, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm partly telling you that just so you could spot me in the video because the most of the action is on the screen where you see these images of Europa coming in, the scientists trying to understand what they're seeing, but then the camera pans around and there I am standing in the back. Let me see if I can actually share this video now. Um, I have to go back to, um, let's see, I'm gonna stop this share for a second because I think I have to reshare. Um, and let me find this. Um, where is it? Hmm. Give me one second. Um, I'm gonna do this fast, but oh, here it is okay. Um, Yeah. Oh, and I have to do something to make it so that it will show do audio, right? Um, uh, share sound. Okay. I think this is going to work. Believe me, it's all going to be worth it. All right. Share screen. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay one of the greatest joys in the life of a planetary scientist. In the early morning hours of July 9, 1979, on the real-time television monitors at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, we began to learn about a world called Europa. These are the modern explorers, men and women trained in astronomy, physics, geology, or engineering, Many of them have devoted five to eight years to this single mission. Cassin's model for Europa says that you, if you started off with it liquid, you could probably pump in enough energy to keep it liquid. Let's see. So the, appeal, the, the Cassin thing said that in order for there to be enough heating going on, you sort of had to start the heating before Europa basically uh, cooled off. Is that right? Yeah, but Gene, what about the relief from the cracks? Many, Shouldn't the cracks and yield and flow also? They gotta sure, be, they gotta they be, be renewed. The Io and Europa, there's a twin, a pair there, and then there's a pair out of Ganymede's cluster. You can't look at the surface of a world so different from ours without wondering how both were made. Just rotate it out a little bit. Right. You see, you see the, the yeah. Voyager presented us with six new worlds in the Jupiter system alone. Maybe. The more you learn about other worlds, the better you understand our own. We speculate, criticize, argue, calculate, reflect, and wonder. We return again and again to the astonishing data. And slowly, we begin to understand. Okay, I now return you to our previously scheduled... Whoops, I have to turn that off. Stop. Okay. There we go. 
So um, anyways, 42 years ago today, that's what I was doing. Um, the next big step for me was um, going to grad school. And I moved out to Arizona to do that um, for the University of Arizona, which was, a, you know, was and still is one of the really um, good places to study planetary science, uh, in part because that's, you know, it's out in Arizona and there's big mountains there and they built big telescopes there back, um, you know, many decades ago. And that um, attracted a community of astronomers and planetary scientists. And so that's still it. Uh, it's largely because of the uh, big telescopes that's the draw there that brought all the scientists there, even though a lot of what we do now is no longer using telescopes because we use a lot of um, spacecraft for a lot of what we do. Anyway, so on the upper left, a nice shot of um, the desert. Um, I can tell you moving out there was very strange for me. I had lived in the Boston area and um, New England my whole life. And when it, the desert at first uh, I found it um, just, it was like moving to another planet. It was very strange and a little bit frightening to me. I, I wasn't sure I liked it. But then after I spent seven years there when I was in grad school and after uh, the end of that, I never wanted to leave. I grew to love um, that part of the country so much. I love Tucson and I love the desert. Uh, really got, um, I really uh, became attached. But these are just a couple of pictures of me and some of my uh, fellow uh, graduate students uh, on the left here. Um, I guess that's me in the hat and the striped jacket. Uh, even though we're in Tucson, we're freezing because we're, uh, we're out in the middle of the night to try to see Halley's Comet in 1986. Um, Comet Halley uh, made an appearance and we went out to the desert. This is early in the morning before dawn. Um, we were out there with some telescopes to try to see the, um, the comet. And then over on the right here, um, I was on a field trip uh, in Hawaii, um, looking at some of the volcanoes there with a couple of my fellow grad students. Um, so um, those uh, those uh, expeditions to observe things and um, ge geological field trips, those were some of the fun parts of grad school. A lot of grad school, of course, was just like, like other school, being in classrooms and studying and learning. Um, and it was very, for me, it was very challenging, but it was also, I, I ended up really uh, having a great time and bonding with my fellow students and uh, making some of my best friendships who are still, um, you know, decades later, still some of my best friends in life and uh, just learning so much and just immersing in this community of people that were fascinated with the planets just, just as I was. So uh, all in all, it was a really valuable experience. And the thing that I discovered in grad school that became a big part of my work and is still a big part of my work is what we call comparative planetology, where you look at the different planets and study their similarities and differences. And you learn things about the way planets work in general. Uh, and this, for instance, in this uh, image, you see um, this is a composite of Venus, Earth, and Mars. Um, and Venus and Mars, of course, are our two near neighbors, uh, nearest neighbors. And to me, this trio, Venus, Earth, and Mars, is really fascinating because Venus and Mars are not just our neighbors, but in many ways, they're the most similar planets to Earth. Um, and yet they're both very different. They've gone in different directions. We think we, the more we study Venus and Mars, the more we learn that their early environments when all three planets were young four and a half billion years ago, all three planets were pretty similar. That is we think Venus and Mars both had uh, oceans or a lot of liquid water and maybe even the conditions where the origin of life could have happened just as it happened on earth around 4 billion years ago. But both Venus and Mars evolved in really different directions and Mars uh, lost its water and dry and became a frozen desert. And Venus lost its water and became a, uh, an, an oven, a super hot, super dry oven world. And so trying to understand what happened to those planets and why they changed and how planets change in general, that's comparative planetology. And that's become a big theme of what I've done uh, in my work. In particular, the Venus-Earth comparison is really interesting to me because Venus and Earth are almost exactly the same size. They're right next door. 
They seem to have started off very similarly, and yet they've evolved in such different ways where Venus is so hot and so dry and lost its oceans and trying to understand what happened to Venus and how we can learn from that about how planets can evolve and also where there can be life in the universe. Um, and that's what we call astrobiology, studying the planets and studying life and trying to understand where there's life elsewhere. And that's also become a major theme of what I do in my career um, is astrobiology. And to me, uh, that's centered on looking at these comparisons of planets and trying to understand their stories and using that to understand where in the universe um, there may be life. Um, so that's, that's a big part of uh, the work that I've done. Um, I, uh, I mentioned Carl Sagan and I, I was just going to show one more picture of him because, uh, you know, he was also a mentor of mine who I worked with scientifically, but another thing Carl Sagan was known for was being a very visible communicator of science. And here he is on the Johnny Carson show, which was the Johnny Carson show, you know, back in the 1970s was like, um, you know, what um, uh, Colbert or um, Jimmy Kimmel or, uh, you know, these late night shows that we have now, the late night talk shows, Johnny Carson was sort of the first one and it was the only one back then. And it was really a big deal to be a guest on Johnny Carson, national television. And Sagan was like, was really, I think the only scientist who was a repeat guest on Johnny Carson because the way he would talk about space exploration was so riveting. Um, that uh, people loved his appearances on Johnny Carson. And he, he became very famous doing that. And then he also, um, you know, he, he helped spread the word about planetary science. And it's interesting because some other scientists didn't approve of the fact that he was doing this. He actually got some grief from the planetary science community. They thought at that time, they thought, well, it wasn't really a serious scientist shouldn't be doing that shouldn't be spending all this time trying to communicate with the public and writing best-selling books and going on television. They should be doing science. It was beneath them. Of course, they were wrong. And I think we've learned that by now. And that's very important for scientists to communicate. Uh, and maybe partly they were people that said this were just jealous of the fact that, that Sagan got uh, so famous and, and frankly, got really rich because he had best-selling books. But at any rate, um, he was kind of a pioneer of being that kind of visible communicating scientist. Um, and he wrote these amazing books and it really inspired me to want to not only do science, but to try to also be a communicator. And that leads me to the other thing that I've done with my career. In addition, in addition to the science that I've pursued, I wanted to mention that I, and I did mention that when I was a college student, I studied writing and it's something I've always been interested. In. I love reading. I love books and um, I always knew I wanted to write books. And then um, I finally got the opportunity. And um, over the years, I've written several books. Um, and um, these are um, the, well, I've written a few other more obscure ones, but these are sort of the main um, uh, popular books I've, I've written um, starting over on the left here. My first book was Venus Revealed which was um, just sort of the whole story of Venus, um, not just the science, but Venus as a goddess in the sky that was seen by ancient people um, and um, had a lot of meaning for people, this, this sky goddess and the ancient astronomers, how they figured out the patterns of Venus's motion. And then the history of what we learned about Venus with telescopes, and then the history of spacecraft investigation, weaving in all the science stories uh, we've um, learned. So that, that book was a lot of fun. And then uh, Lonely Planets, um, The Natural Philosophy of Alien Life. That's my book. Well, just like it says, it's about, it's about aliens, about alien life, but not just, um, you know, also when I say natural philosophy, what I mean is um, sort of the deeper questions, you know, how, when we think about aliens, how does it affect the way we think about ourselves? What does it mean to be a living creature in this universe? Is life and consciousness like we have, is that something that just happens on a lot of planets because the universe uh, has conditions to make life and then some of that life evolves awareness and consciousness and then starts thinking about the universe and studying it? Is that just something that's happened here or is that something that's happened many places? Um, so I talk about those questions and sort of the history of ideas about aliens and a little bit about UFOs and a little bit about um, our current efforts to 
try to find alien life either by exploring planets or by observing exoplanets, the planets around other stars with telescopes, or even by what we call SETI, S-E-T-I, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, where we listen with radio telescopes in any way we can to see if maybe somebody out there is sending us messages. So all of that was uh, was in this book. Um, my, uh, my next book um, is called Earth and Human Hands, Shaping Our Planet's Future. And that is about the question of how does the planetary view affect the way we think of ourselves on this planet and our own future? In other words, almost think if we were aliens watching our own planet in time lapse and had seen life evolve and then complex life evolve, animals, and then seen all the changes that are happening to the earth now because of humans changing the atmosphere with climate change, changing the nature of the land surface with cities and highways, launching spacecraft into space, all these things, lighting up the night with lights, all these things are changing on our planets. What does that mean from a, a planetary evolution point of view? How does that fit into the story of our planet? And thinking of it that way, how can that help us think about our own future? Um, that was the idea behind this book, Earth in Human Hands. Um, and then um, the most recent book I wrote with my friend, Alan Stern, Chasing New Horizons Inside the Epic First Mission to Pluto. And that's about the mission called the spacecraft called New Horizons that made it to Pluto just um, six years ago this July, six years ago this month um, was the first time humans ever saw Pluto up close. And you can see on the cover there that beautiful picture of uh, Pluto with a heart on it. We had never seen that until six years ago. Um, and Alan Stern, my co-author, he's that the leader of that mission. Um, and it's an amazing story, the story of that mission, because Alan and his friends and colleagues, they got the idea for that mission in 1989 when they were just students. And they said, we want to send a mission to Pluto. And they went to NASA and said, hey, we finished, you know, Voyager's done. This is 1989, just after Voyager got to Neptune, the last of those Voyager encounters I was talking about. And they said, well, what's next? What's left? Well, we've never been to Pluto. So these young scientists and students, they went to NASA and said, we want to send a mission to Pluto because that's the one we haven't been to yet. And, and NASA said, oh, that's never going to happen. It's too far away. It would cost too much money. Forget it, kids. But they didn't give up on the idea. They got together and said, you know what? We want to make this happen. What can we do? We, we need to rally support. We need to make a plan. We need to figure it out. And they just didn't give up on the idea. And they worked on it for years and years and decades even. And 26 years later, after that first meeting um, where they decided as students to try to do this, 26 years later, they uh, succeeded and the New Horizons mission uh, made it to Pluto. So they started off as students. Now they're all sort of, you know, middle-aged scientists. And uh, but they they kept with it. They followed their plan. They didn't give up. And so, in addition to the story of the mission and the science of Pluto, which is really cool, there's the story of human um, adventure and just um, sort of um, perseverance of uh, of. Uh, you know, just enduring and sticking, sticking to your dream, um, which sometimes uh, pays off in a big way. Um, so anyways, that's, you know, that's been the other part of my career. And I, you know, I think different scientists have different mixes of things that they do. But for me, that mix of science and communication has been very rewarding. And it's led me to a pretty unusual career. In addition to being a university professor, I worked for many years as a museum curator. Um, I, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where my job was about half doing science research and about half um, doing different kinds of communication. Um, and then I worked at the Library of Congress um, as a researcher. Actually, that's where I wrote this book, Earth in Human Hands, when I was working at the Library of Congress. And now I work at a place called Planetary Science Institute, where it's full-time research, except for I'm only working there half time. And the rest of the time I'm doing my writing and other speaking and other communication things. So um, this is all by way of saying there isn't just one kind of scientific career. There are actually a lot of different paths you can follow and you can mix together different um, educational and research and communication and other kinds of um, other kinds of activities into a career 
in science. Oh, also, I've managed to keep up the music. Um, I mentioned uh, that I was into music in high school, and I always tried to keep that up. Well, so this is fun. I've got a I've got this group called the the uh, House Band of the Universe, and we play in planetariums. And we do music that's inspired by the universe and it's instrumental. And then I do these spoken word narrations where I talk about the story of the universe and the planets kind of over the music. And then we do instrumental passages and show images in the planetarium of the evolution of the universe. And this is over here on the right, you can see a still image where we're playing in the foreground and there's a projection of the sun in the background. Um, so uh, that's a way I've also managed to keep alive some of my other interest and find some way to to combine them which is a fun way to fun thing to do when you can do it um i'll skip that um well okay i won't but this is this is sort of bragging but one really great thing that happened to me yeah that was a big honor for me several years ago was i was awarded something called the carl sagan medal by the um by the uh, american astronomical society and the Division of Planetary Sciences, which is within the American Astronomical Society. It's the big group of, of planetary scientists like me that get together every year. And uh, every year they give out this medal, the Carl Sagan Medal, and it's for communication, public communication of planetary science. So when I was given the Carl Sagan Medal, it was very meaningful to me because as I mentioned, Carl Sagan was a mentor to me and to be awarded that by my, my peers um, and here's Brother Guy Consomagno over on the left, who's both a Jesuit priest and a planetary scientist, uh, putting the medal around my neck. And there's me giving my talk. Um, and that was very meaningful to me uh, to be honored by my peers with this medal named after uh, my mentor. So that was kind of fun. The last thing I want to mention, because I, I want to be sure and leave some time for questions and discussion, but um, I did want to mention, I, I, I talked about, uh, this is the, the, my journey from high school to Venus and the Venus part of it. I mentioned in grad school, I got really interested in the Venus earth comparison and, and the question of how Venus evolved to be so different from earth and what that means for how earth like planets can evolve in general and what, Earth, what might be happening to all the Earth-like planets elsewhere in the universe and where there might be life. That's been a question I've pursued my whole career. And my colleagues and I have proposed many times to NASA to, to fly new Venus missions. But the, pro the process of proposing new missions to NASA, new planetary missions, is very competitive and very hard because there are many good mission ideas. And there's only funding to support you know, a few missions every decade. Uh, and so there are many more good ideas than get flown. So my friends and I, my colleagues and I, we've gotten very used to rejection. We put together these great proposals and the proposals are huge. Each one is the size of like a phone book with detailed plans and drawings and, you know, cost estimates and engineering models and all this stuff. Uh, and then we're used to getting rejected. <laughs> we've been doing this for years. But this past year, uh, we won the competition, finally. And so we're sending this mission to Venus and our mission is called Da Vinci, uh, which you can see over here on the left stands for Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry and Imaging. And this is a probe that we're going to drop into the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, and as it falls through the atmosphere, we're gonna measure all these things that have never been measured before. Um, so this is a schematic you can see in the left, there's our probe, it falls through the atmosphere, a parachute opens up, it measures things on the way down, and then it actually goes to the surface. It's not supposed to really survive on the surface uh, because the surface is so harsh, but it takes images, it takes pictures and measurements right down to the surface. And we'll get our first ever close up pictures from above of the surface of Venus. Um, I won't go into detail now because I wanna get to questions, but this just shows um, some of the scientific instruments that we're carrying on board uh, here, there's something called a, a mass spectrometer where you pull in some of the atmospheric gas and then it's an instrument where you can pull apart the different molecules and atoms and see what the atmosphere is made out of, answer some questions that we, we have been wondering about for a long time about what gases and isotopes are in that atmosphere, uh, something called a tunable laser spectrometer um, which is also designed to do very precise measurements of some of the atmospheric gases. 
something called the atmospheric structure investigation, which measures the temperature and pressure on the way down. Uh, and then finally, uh, Vendi, the Venus Descent Imager, which is the camera system that we will uh, observe as we get close to the surface, will actually take pictures. And we're landing in this really cool area of Venus that's very mountainous and rugged. And we're gonna take pictures for the first time from above as we descend of these, these mountains of Venus. So uh, this it doesn't launch till 2029, but now we've got the green light from NASA so we can start building it. Um, and that's the thing that I'm most excited about for the next phase of my career. And with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, I thank you for listening. And we can um, move on to questions. Our first question is from Anime, who asks, what is the best way to secure an internship or research position in universities in NASA? What is the best way to secure um, internship or research position at universities or NASA? Um, the thing that worked for me was just knocking on doors, making personal connections. Um, you know, when I took a class, I would, if I was interested in the class, I would talk to the professor afterwards, get to know them. If they didn't have a job or an internship, they might know somebody else who would. Um, write a letter or an email if you hear about a scientist doing something interesting to you. Um, you know, don't be shy. Uh, you know, everybody's busy. Everybody gets a lot of emails. You know, maybe that day they don't answer your email because they had 20 emails they didn't have time to answer. But, you know, don't be discouraged by anything like that. You'll be surprised that sometimes somebody will really respond and say, oh, I'm so glad you're interested. You know, we have an internship coming up. Also, NASA has these programs, these summer um, internship programs at several of the um, several of the NASA centers. Um, the the uh, Lunar and Planetary Institute has summer uh, has a summer um, program for undergraduates. Um, and there's several of them. So I would also say, you know, go on the NASA websites uh, and search for internships, or maybe we could even put some of the information in the chat. I don't know if, if we can do that here, but, but there are definitely between the NASA internships and between just, you know, going out of your way to meet people that are doing interesting things and not being shy, telling them that you're interested and asking them if they know anybody who's got an internship, you'd be surprised what you can just turn up by showing your interest to people that are, um, that are working on the uh, science that, that you're excited about. Um, another question that we have is, how will the probe deal with intense pressures of Venus's atmosphere? Is this a special con constraint or a modern spacecraft able to handle this pressure easily? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the toughest things about exploring Venus, I mean, you might notice that we've had a lot more Mars missions than Venus missions. And sometimes those of us in the Venus community, we grumble about that. We're like, oh, great, another Mars mission, which is kind of a joke because in reality, I'm very excited about Mars missions too. I mean, I'm interested in the whole solar system and every Mars mission is very exciting to me. But the reason, part of the reason we've had fewer Venus missions is because Venus does have these intense challenges for exploration. If you uh, try to observe it from orbit, all you see is clouds. And if you try to go to the surface, you can get crushed or burnt to a crisp by the high pressure and high temperature. So um, it's a real challenge. To answer your question, the way we deal with it with this particular mission, Da Vinci, um, is actually we do the whole mission really quickly. We don't try to survive very long in the surface condition. As I mentioned, this spacecraft will not even survive on the surface. In the future, there are other missions we want to do where we will build them in such a way that we could survive on the surface and withstand the pressure. And we have ways to do that by building a sort of pressure shell, just the way, think of the uh, vehicles that go to the deep ocean of earth, you know, these submersibles, and they build these really high pressure vehicles. You could do something like that on Venus. In fact, it has been done. The Russians did 
had some landers on Venus that they only lasted for a, an hour or two, but they lasted for a little bit and then because they had pressure vessels. But in this case, we just um, we only last for about an hour on the way down and we take all the information as we're approaching the surface and we radio it back as we take it. We have a radio, um, a, a transmitter with an antenna and we send it back. And the idea is you just do your work quickly and send the information back because you know you're going to get you're going to get destroyed. So that's this mission has a design philosophy of just doing everything fast and not even trying to survive. Um, but in the future, if we actually did want to survive on the surface, then we would have to do something inventive, like just put it inside a huge, really strong pressure vessel um, built of some really strong materials, like the, the kind of thing they use to explore the deep ocean. Our next question is from Aaron, who asks, why does Venus have retrograde rotation? Was it a result of a collision like the one that created our moon? Great question. Uh, yeah, so um, the question is, why does Venus have retrograde rotation? Meaning that um, Venus rotates on its axis backwards compared to most of the other planets, um, and which is, uh, which is funny because if you were on the surface of Venus, that means that the sun would rise in the west and set in the east except it wouldn't rise, it wouldn't really because you could never see the sun because it's cloudy all the time. But if you could see the sun, <laughs> it would rise in, in the other direction and set in the other direction. And the we don't completely know the answer to that, but the best idea is, just as you suggested, Aaron, probably it had to do with an, a collision that happened early on. We know that when the planets were forming, they formed by collision, smaller um, smaller planetesimals, we call them, smaller objects crashing together in what we call accretion to form larger objects. And we know, for instance, that that's why Earth has a big moon, because the final stages of that accretion, there were big collisions going on. And that one, a, a Mars-sized object hit Earth and splashed enough material into orbit to make to make Earth's moon. So if the right object hit at the right time, it would have sent Venus spinning backwards. And so we think that that's what happened, but it's very hard to get definitive proof of um, something that happened so long ago. So there's a little bit of a question mark there, but the best idea we have is that it probably had to do with collisions when the planets were just forming, giant collisions. Um, also, Jay has a question. How much chemistry do you do for astrobiology and what significance does it have? For example, what do you what do you study having to do with elements that are are and aren't found in certain areas? Oh, what's the question? How much chemistry? Uh, yes, how much yeah. chemistry do you have to do for astrobiology? Yeah, so that's a good question. So astrobiology has a lot of chemistry in it. Um, for one thing, there's the all the organic chemistry of trying to understand life on earth and its origins. And, you know, as far as we know, uh, I mean, chemist uh, life as we know, it depends on organic chemistry, um, which is, you know, big um, elements of, with lots of carbon and other things getting together in interesting ways. That's what we are. That's what life is. So we wonder if that can be happening in other environments. So a lot of it has to do with trying to understand both the sources of organic chemicals and then how the behavior of organic chemicals in different environments and also trying to understand the organic chemistry of earth's early environment and understanding the origin of life and how that might play out elsewhere so there's tons of organic chemistry but there's also other kinds of chemistry because for instance um you know, we look at meteorites and rocks from other planets and try to understand their stories and their origins. And all, a lot of that has to do with analyzing the chemicals and the isotopes of these rocks and trying to piece together their stories. And for instance, I mentioned our mission to, uh, to, to Venus. Um, a lot of what we're going to be doing is analyzing the chemistry of that atmosphere with the goal of using that to tell us about the early history of that atmosphere and whether it might have had habitable oceans on board. So, um, so the answer is a lot. There's a lot of chemistry um, in astrobiology. And certainly, I mean, one of the cool things about astrobiology 
is that it's a uh, it's a synthesis of lots of different fields. It involves obviously astronomy and biology, hence the name, but it also involves chemistry and physics and geology. And so if you're interested in astrobiology, you can study so many different aspects of the science. Um, you know, you can go off to college and you could say, I'm going to major in chemistry, but I want to be an astrobiologist, or I'm going to major in physics, but I want to be an astrobiologist or astronomy or geology or biology. There's a lot of different ways you can approach astrobiology and certainly chemistry is a, is a very important one. Our next question is from Amanda who asks, if you could pitch any mission to NASA with guaranteed funding, what would it be? And this is besides the current planetary mission you have pitched. Oh man, that's a dangerous question. <laughs> Any mission with guaranteed funding. <laughs> oh man, and now I, I'm picturing myself traveling at warp speed with all my best friends to, <laughs> all around the galaxy. But let's be a slightly more realistic. Um, I, um, I would love to do long lived. I mean, we got that question earlier about the pressure on Venus. I would love to do long lived surface science at Venus. Um, that is not just something that can last for an hour or two at the surface of Venus, but something that can last for months or years. Um, because there's some science that would be really important. Um, I want to know what's inside of Venus. In order to do that, I want to put seism se seismographs on Venus and get seismic information. Do you ever ask yourself, how do we know about the interior of the Earth? I mean, you see those charts and you say, here's the core, here's the mantle, there's the liquid core, the solid core. How do we know? Nobody's ever seen the interior of the Earth. We know it by with seismic information, you know, which is basically sound waves traveling through the Earth. And then we, we can analyze them and see what's inside. And Venus being our sister planet or our, our sibling planet, we really, it would be so interesting to know, is it the same in the interior as Earth or is it different in some ways? And how does that relate to what we see on the surface with the geology and the atmosphere? The only way we're going to really answer that is by long lived surface landers on Venus. And it's something we know that we could do, um, but it would require some new technology development to uh, develop things that could really uh, develop electronics that could really work at that temperature and, and components that could withstand that pressure. So, but if you, uh, you know, if you gave me several billion dollars um, and said, um, you know, this is do what you want with it, that would probably be the thing I would most want to do would be a, a really in-depth Venus mission where you could, um, you could really understand the interior. Of course, my mind is, churning as i say this i'm thinking well what about submarines on europa <laughs> that's another thing i'd like to do you know we're going to Euro europa that moon of jupiter i showed pictures of um and we're going back there um in uh next decade with a spacecraft called europa clipper that's going to make several close flybys and analyze the surface in different ways and maybe even land <laughs> But the really cool thing to do on Europa would be to tunnel through the ice and explore with a submarine underneath the ice and see if there's anything swimming around there, which again, we know we could do, but it's gonna, it would be much more expensive th th with our current technology than our current budgets allowed. So, um, you know, there's, if you actually tell me I've got unlimited funding, my mind starts really uh, going into overdrive with all these things that ultimately I would really like to do. Um, our next question is from Sarah. You mentioned incorporating other interests in science. Do you have any examples of collaboration between visual arts and space science? Yes, great, great question. Visual arts and space science. Um, several examples. So um, one is um, I know some artists, some visual artists who've been very inspired by space science and who've incorporated it in their work. Uh, several artists. Um, there's a there's a an artist who lives in Denver named Monica Aiello, A I E L L O. Uh, if you get a chance, um, Google her and look up her. She does paintings that are inspired by the moons of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn. 
but not just trying to recreate them in a photorealistic way, which a lot of artists do and do really beautifully, but more inspired by and using the textures and the feeling of and creating these, these amazing works um, that are uh, just um, sort of uh, very evocative of the feeling of, of these other moons. Um, there's also a, a really important role for visual artists in helping us uh, um, convey our ideas. Um, there's an artist, there's a scientist slash artist named James Tuttle Keen, who um, does these sort of, I wouldn't call them cartoons. I guess they are sort of cartoons, but very sophisticated cartoons of planetary science concepts. And he comes to our meetings and somebody's giving a talk about the, you know, the geology of some moon or some planet or something. And James is sitting there and making a sketch and um, conveying the ideas in this visual language that then he puts out on the internet. That's really wonderful because it, it helps um, convey our ideas in a way that words just, just can't. And even the photographs can't because he'll show, so, you know, whatever process the scientist is describing, he'll, uh, do this sort of graphic um, uh, graphic art uh, illustration uh, of that. Um, and I've certainly, I've had a lot of fun working with artists in, uh, for some of my books and trying to uh, convey, um, convey things in different ways. Um, oh, the last thing I'll mention is there's a, there's a guy named Carter Emart and he's the director of astro visualization at the, at the planetarium in New York City, the Rose Planetarium. What a cool job title he has, Director of Astro Visualization. And he's really somebody that I would consider as on the artist scientist um, boundary, does both, because he uses the planetarium in a way to convey scientific information. And yet he's also uh, definitely an artist as far as the way he goes about showing things visually. So yeah, I think uh, because space science is so naturally visual uh, and we're such visual creatures, I think there's a huge role for the collaboration between artists and scientists, both to convey the information and then also to relate the human experience of what it's like to, uh, to learn about um, other environments in the universe. Um, both Joey and Lucy have similar questions in that uh, regarding your thoughts on like on signs of life on Venus, um, given that fossil finds have been found in Venus's atmosphere, and whether the Da Vinci mission will be considering the chemical. Yeah, great question. So um, I personally have advocated for a long time the possibility that there is life on Venus today not on the surface because the surface is so hot and so dry. You just could not have certainly life as we know it, life based on organic chemicals. It's just impossible in the surface environment of Venus because it, well, it's just too hot. It would cook instantly, but maybe up in the clouds of Venus where it's moderate temperature and pressure. Um, and there are sources of chemistry, uh, sources of possible nutrients and energy uh, the problem, of course, is that the clouds are made out of concentrated sulfuric acid. And the question of whether or not anything could um, live in that environment is a challenging one, but it's, we don't know the answer. But it's something a lot of us have been thinking about for a while. If there is a habitable zone on Venus, it's probably in the clouds, not on the surface. Well, so this is an idea that's been out there for a while. But then, as you mentioned, last year, there was a report that uh, this chemical phosphine, which is a phosphorus atom with three hydrogen atoms, pH three, phosphine, uh, was detected uh, using telescopes, detected in the atmosphere of Venus. And that was really intriguing because phosphine is a gas that shouldn't be on Venus in those quantities. And when I say shouldn't be, I mean, who, who says what should and shouldn't be, except for by the rules of chemistry, you can say, given this chemical and given this chemical, that other chemical shouldn't be there because it would react very quickly and it would disappear. So if you find phosphine in an environment like that, it means something is creating the phosphine. There's a source. And what's interesting about phosphine is that on Earth, the only sources of phosphine 
that are at all significant are biological. Phosphine is something that's made by life on earth and not really made by other natural processes. Um, and in fact, even before this detection was made on Venus, there were people that wrote papers about what gases would be good biosignatures, that is good, good signs of life on another planet. And they included phosphine as a gas that if you found it in another atmosphere, it would be a promising sign of possible life. So when this detection, this announcement was made last year that they had found phosphine on Venus, um, of course, some people got really excited and said, well, wait a minute, could that be a sign of life? Um, however, the plot thickens. Um, other researchers looked at the same data and they claimed the phosphine isn't really there, that the first researchers made a mistake and that it's really some other gas like sulfur dioxide, which isn't that surprising to find on Venus that's making this signal. Um, <clears throat> and at this point, it's up in the air. I don't know who's right. Uh, it's an exciting question. It's okay that people disagree. This is how science works. Somebody publishes something. Other people say, wait a minute, maybe that's not right. And they publish something else and we work it out over time. It's actually, that's what science does is it corrects you know, if people make a mistake, somebody else corrects it. And that's how we, over time, that's why we have confidence in what we know about the planets, because when, when there are mistakes, they get corrected. So it's still an early stage. And honestly, I don't know if the phosphine signal is real or not. And if it is real, it doesn't mean there's definitely life on Venus. It, it certainly doesn't mean that, but it, it could mean that. It means there's some unusual chemistry going on in the clouds. And for me, it's further, I already wanted to study the clouds of Venus because I already think it's an interesting part of the planet that hasn't been studied very well. And I've, I've always thought there's at least the possibility of some kind of life form in the clouds. I wouldn't say it's necessarily probable, but it's worth checking for because we just don't know about life in the universe. So any place that's plausible as a habitable environment, we should investigate just in case we learn something amazing. So then that this, to me, this phosphine increases the case that we need to check that out. And to answer your question, the Da Vinci um, probe, it will be able to, uh, it will be able to look for phosphine with its instruments. So, uh, and other people are talking about possibly sending new probes up in the future that would look even more sensitively for phosphine. So if the phosphine holds out, I'd say right now, we don't know. People are going to be doing follow-up observations and trying to figure out if it's real. If it turns out it is real, it's certainly something we want to investigate very carefully with Da Vinci and then also maybe with some other missions in the future that are even more specifically designed to really get at that question. Um, so Joey T and Tara have a similar question. How did you balance your interests in pursuing them, especially given how inter interdisciplinary they are? Is it easy to combine your interest in some way? So I missed part of that. How do I combine interest in, in which? Um, how do you combine your interest in some way? Um, which is the follow-up question. The, the, in, the Combine the interest in science and music, are they asking about, or in? Um, they didn't specify, but I'm assuming science and music. Yeah, well, um, I mean, one thing that's great, I mean, I'll answer the question in a couple different ways because there's a couple different things they could have been asking about. So one thing that's great about astrobiology as a science is that it's very broad and you can, as a science, you can combine a lot of different interests. Like I've always, I think I made it clear, I've always been really interested in planets and just learning about the solar system. But I'm also interested in questions of evolution of life. And I've also been kind of, always interested in questions about a philosophy of science. Um, and sort of what science means for human values. Um, and what's neat to me about astrobiology is it naturally combines all of that. It helps if you, I mean, it really helps to learn some kind of science very specifically, like be a physics major or be a biology major or be a chemistry major, be a geology major, learn one science really, really well or astronomy. But then with astrobiology, you can combine it with all these other interests and you can sort of learn a little bit of this, a little bit of that and combine it all together. So I love that about it, that it allows you to be, have broad interests and find a way to fit them together. Now, as far as the science and music, for me, um, 
those have often been separate things in my life. The music is sometimes what I'll just use to sort of blow off steam and have something that takes me away from the other things that I'm working on and just do for fun and get together with friends and sit down and play music or just, you know, pick up my guitar at the end of a long day. So it's not something I would say I've always tried to combine with my science, but what's neat about um, science, especially these days, is that there's a lot of um, interest in people communicating science in different ways. So I'd mentioned the science art connection that somebody asked about. And for me with this, this group, the house band of the universe that was mentioned in the introduction. And I think I mentioned it briefly in my talk. Um, that was the first time I said, you know what, I'm going to try to put the science and music together and do some public, public thing. Um, and that, you know, it, I feel like it really works well together because in the planetarium, um, you know, you're sort of sitting back there and looking at the images of the night sky and the planets and so forth. And music is something that sort of, uh, I think sort of helps us just travel in our minds and facilitates the imagination. And, um, you know, for me, the idea of using music to a kind of a company of visual an intellectual journey through the universe. It was a very natural thing to try to do. And it's something I've been trying to do more lately. So I would say for me personally, they haven't always been something I've even wanted to combine because sometimes one is sort of my temporary escape from the other one, if that makes sense. But, but more recently, I have been combining them in ways that I'm finding is a lot of fun and people seem to respond well to it. Uh, and I, I would say also, that having the experience of being a performing musician, because I've already, I've always done music on the side and I've always have done some level of performance, whether it was, you know, with rock bands when I was in high school or other kinds of music at other stages in my life. I think that that made me a better teacher and better communicator about science because you get good at sort of feeling a room are just comfortable with being um, on a stage or at the front of a classroom and relating to people in different ways. I don't know, I can't describe exactly what it is, but somehow the experience of performing music and being comfortable relating to audiences in that way, I think helped me when I was trying to learn how to be a decent uh, teacher and lecturer and communicator, because it's all just about, uh, you know, relating to audiences and sharing something in different ways. Katrina asks her next question, which is based on what factors does NASA select its mission? Ah, yeah. Um, based on what factors does NASA select its missions? Well, before this year, I would have made some sarcastic answer and said, well, they'll select any of them if they're not Venus missions. <laughs> but that's a joke. <laughs> um, you know, so th there are several uh, factors. You know, one is um, what is the science that this mission is trying to address? What are the questions it's trying to answer? You know, are they essential? Are they important? Do they fit into NASA's you know, long-term strategic goals of, um, you know, trying to understand the solar system and so forth. And then is the plan realistic? Will this specific mission <clears throat> with a specific design and the specific instruments that you're going to put on board, will they actually answer those questions? Um, and then there's a whole lot of questions about, um, realism of costs and risk you know how risky is your plan uh what are the chances of success are you trying to do they like things that are innovative but not too innovative are you using are you saying you're going to use technology that's never been tested before it's never been tried before it's important to show that the technology has been tested enough so that it'll, it'll work um, are your cost estimates realistic? Um, is the team up for the task? Is the team good enough? Can they do what they said they will do? Um, you know, these days, I think they also look at things like, you know, is there um, is there diversity on your team? Is it, you know, is it representative of, um, you know, all the different um, kinds of people? Um, 
that um, that ought to be included in a mission like that? Um, is it, um, do you have a plan to share with the public what you're doing? Is there an education plan that goes with the science plan? You know, that all these things come into it, but I'd say the main things are, you know, is the science good? Is the science realistic? Are the costs realistic? Is it, um, is it, uh, likely to succeed or is it too risky? Um, and then you get evaluated on all those things and then you go up against you know there's it's a very steep competition because as i said before there's a lot of really good missions i mean you know th this last round just to give you a sense that that our mission got selected um there were i think about 20 missions that went in for the and then they do what they call a down select to phase a where out of all those 20 they pick four to be in. it's basically like making the finals getting into the finals they pick four for phase a and that happened a, a year ago you find out if you're in phase a and then all the other missions are just rejected and then the four that are in phase a they say okay you're in phase a that means you have one more year to develop your concept further we're going to give you a million dollars and a year and you have to answer all these questions and develop the concept in more detail. And then at the end of that year of phase A, we're going to down select again, and we're going to pick either one or two of those four to actually fly. So when we made phase A, we were excited because it meant we had a really good shot. But I've been in that situation. I've been in phase A with missions three times before where I said, oh, great, we're in the finals, and then not had my mission selected after that year. So I've had that experience too. So this time for phase A of this, this round, there were four missions selected, and two of them were Venus missions. One was our probe, the Da Vinci probe, which I, I described, uh, a probe that drops into the atmosphere. One was a mission called um, Veritas, which is an orbiter, a Venus orbiter, which doesn't enter into the atmosphere, but orbits around and maps the surface in different ways using radar and infrared, two Venus missions. And then the other two we were competing with were an Io mission. I mentioned Jupiter's volcanic volcanic moon Io and a Triton mission. Triton is a, uh, a moon of Neptune that was first investigated by Voyager in that mission I told you about. And all four were great. And we didn't know if we were going to get selected or not. And we thought, well, at least they'll probably pick one of the Venus missions because it's been so long since we've had a Venus mission and it's kind of Venus's time. But then if, Venus, if it wasn't the best mission, they wouldn't have picked it because the competition is so stiff. And some of us said, well, God, wouldn't it be great if they selected both Venus missions? And then other people said, well, what are the chances of that? But that it turns out that's what happened that of those four missions, they selected the two Venus mission, our mission, Da Vinci, which is the, entry probe and the other mission um, of Veritas, which is the orbiter, which is great for those of us in the Venus community, because the people on the other mission, they're our friends too. And, you know, we were in competition with them. So we really wanted to be selected, but now that we're both going, we can all work together and, um, you know, sort of figure out how to make mi the two missions work together and really um, have this be the decade of Venus. So we're pretty psyched about that, but yeah, the, Conditions, uh, the, the competition is pretty steep and all of those different factors I mentioned uh, ultimately go into it. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I guess it'll be our final question. Um, this is from Kavya. What does a regular day in your life look like? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, it's so funny, I, I that question, um, I get that sometimes it's so hard to describe because, um, there's, you know, things are so different on different days. I mean, honestly, again, I have a sarcastic answer, <laughs> which is that I, I sit there and answer my email all day, just like everybody else, <laughs> you know, but some days, honestly, that's what it is. I just sit at my laptop and I, um, between answering email and then I'm working on various projects. I mean, because I'm on these mission proposals, I'll get requests from the the um, the principal investigators of the missions to, you know, can you check this out? Can you make us a graph of this for a presentation we've got coming up? I'm preparing talks. When I have time to actually do my science, then I'm doing calculations and making presentations to to give um, to give talks. Um, normally 
meaning not during this past weird COVID year we've had. Um, I'm traveling a lot, going to conferences and giving talks and uh, collaborating with colleagues. Of course, I haven't been doing that recently. Um, and then, um, you know, sometimes at night I'm getting together with my friends and playing music and so forth. But it's th there really isn't a typical day. And that's I guess that's part of what I like about it is that um, other than the fact that I do spend way too much time answering email, like everybody these days, um, it's really pretty diverse. You know, sometimes I'm doing things like this. I'm giving talks to different groups. Um, I'm, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's been such a strange year. I'm trying to remember what life was like before that. But um, when I'm not traveling, I'm at my computer, um, I guess, like a lot of people, but that involves a lot of different activities between preparing talks and sometimes actually getting to do my science, doing calculations. I'm, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time reading and keeping up on the literature. And also I have to read stuff for my work. I get asked, you know, part of science is peer review. So when you write a paper, your colleagues read that paper and review it for a journal. So I spend a lot of time doing that too, where I get sent papers and asked to peer review them. So in a way that's like, oh, I have to read some more. But on the other hand, I'm like, wow, I'm getting paid to read something interesting. You know, it beats breaking rocks, as they say. <laughs> so uh, it's it's very hard to say what a typical day is, but it's some mix of all those activities I just described. Awesome. We thank you so much, Dr. Grinspoon, for being with us today. Um, and I... We thank you so much, Dr. Grinspoon, for being with us today. Well, thank you. It's been a, uh, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. We really thank I am having so much trouble with my. Thank you so much. Everybody could unmute and give them a hand. Or I say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm having so many issues technologically today. I, I apologize, but we we really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Do you want to stop your YouTube? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll stop.